good morning and uh, welcome to the City of Toronto's COVID-19 media briefing for Thursday, January the 6th, 2022. Joining us today is Toronto Mayor John Tory, Toronto's, Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen Davila, and Toronto Fire Chief and Incident Commander for COVID-19, Chief Matthew Pegg, Mayor Tory. Well, Brad, thank you and good morning. And uh, even in these difficult, uh, challenging days, we have to have some good news to report. And I am gratified uh, as mayor and on behalf of our entire team to report that we continue to make progress helping Toronto residents to get vaccinated uh, as our best weapon in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, as of uh, now, more than 6 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been administered by Team Toronto. And this is another important milestone as we go along uh, trying to achieve various objectives in terms of the vaccination of Torontonians. And as we now confront Omicron, uh, we continue to move as quickly as we can to ramp up third dose uh, efforts in particular. We've increased Team Toronto's total vaccination capacity to more than 1.2 million doses per month. We're constantly working to add new vaccine appointments because we know that there is still strong demand for third doses. City staff have worked to add 8,500 new vaccine appointments in the city run immunization clinics this Sunday and Monday. These 8,500 new appointments will be live in the provincial booking system tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. We are now also rolling out fourth doses in the city's 10 long-term care homes, with the first ones being administered today at the True Davidson Acres in East York with the help of the Michael Guerin Hospital. City staff will be working to deliver these fourth doses in the long-term care residences, the nine other ones that we own in the coming days. Team Toronto is also doing everything it can and will do everything that it can to help school boards and the province to safely return to in-person learning in our schools in two weeks. Throughout the pandemic, Toronto Public Health has worked uh, to support in-class learning and help children and teens get vaccinated against COVID-19. Today, I want to under outline the steps that are being taken to help get more education workers and students vaccinated over the coming days an important contribution that we can and will make as a city to getting schools open again on January 17th, the date set by the province. The steps would be as follows uh, at this stage of the game. Number one, dedicated mass immunization clinics for Toronto school staff. Four vaccination clinics with appointments specifically for education workers will be held in two city-run vaccination clinics this Sunday, January the 9th, and next Sunday, January the 16th. We are working with the Toronto School Board to uh, help schedule employees for vaccination appointments at these appointments at these clinics. And these are school board employees, many of whom will be uh, educators. This effort will help more than 3,500 education workers get vaccinated as soon as possible in the City of Toronto. Two, school-based clinics. More than 27 clinics including 22 Toronto Public Health Clinics, are now planned to be held in schools over the next two weeks to help students, their families, and education workers get vaccinated. Team Toronto is working to add even more of these clinics, but as of this moment, there will be 27, including 22 public health clinics, now planned to be held in the schools over the next two weeks. Hospital and Ontario health teams are working with the school boards to offer more school-based vaccination clinics in areas where vaccination rates need to be increased. Point three, we will be redeploying Toronto Public Health staff to support additional school clinics. Toronto Public Health is redeploying staff from other areas to work on additional school-based clinics, which will be focused on vaccinating students and education workers at several schools as soon as possible. All of this work builds on the vaccination efforts underway over the last several months. And of course, in and of itself, the increase in capacity from 400,000 to 1.2 uh, doses has hopefully, and I'm sure has, positively affected many uh, education workers and families uh, involving students uh, in the school system. Since November 1st, Team Toronto held approximately 244 school vaccination clinics across Toronto. Schools are essential for the health development and well-being of children, and Toronto is supporting school boards to safely return to in-person learning in schools as quickly as possible. To date, 92% of 12 to 17-year-olds have their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and 88% have two doses. 
More than 100,000 doses of vaccine have been administered as well to 5 to 11-year-olds in just over a month, with 45 percent of kids having received their first dose. And that campaign very much continues to be a priority and is wrapped in to some of the initiatives that I have announced this morning. As we outlined Tuesday, the Omicron variant of the COVID-19 virus continues to spread and is hitting much closer to home for many people across the City of Toronto. Its effects are here uh, at the City as well. They're evident to us here uh, in admi administering the City government. As such, and as we began to outline the other day, the City of Toronto is taking proactive measures to ensure that essential and critical City services are protected and can continue to be delivered to the people of the City of Toronto. One way to ensure the effective and efficient delivery of essential and critical services by the City during the pandemic is the redeployment of staff where help is needed the most, both immediately and in the near future. Today, we're sharing the top-level outline of our tiered staff redeployment plan should it be required as a result of higher numbers of unplanned staff absences, mainly uh, due to illness. And we've gone as high in our contingency planning as a 60% absence rate uh, due to illness related to uh, COVID-19 and other things such as isolation requirements. The City's tiered staff redeployment plan includes the following four stages. Tier 1, staff previously redeployed in the initial wave of COVID-19 in 2020. Tier 2, staff assigned to city services scaled down or temporarily discontinued as a result of the province's latest protective measures, including, for example, parks, forestry and recreation part-time staff uh, in programs that have been put off because we are not able to offer them under provincial rules, as well as some seasonal staff who are not currently working. The city is currently in this stage, stage two, tier two. Tier three, staff identified as being able to pause their current work to support areas of greater need. And tier four, staff volunteering to be redeployed and able to leave their base position. The triggers for stage three, then four, will be based on increases in unplanned staff absences. Again, those absences mainly related to uh, actual infection with COVID-19 uh, or isolation required as a result of uh, different factors or uh, other similar uh, circumstances. Redeployed staff will first be assigned to vaccination clinics, to city-run shelters, and to the city's 10 long-term care homes, followed by other critical and essential services as required. Already, hundreds of staff in these critical and essential divisions have been redeployed within these divisions to areas that require the most people right now. Redeployment started in December, and we are currently working with and identifying staff in Tier 2. At this time, we have more than 100 staff who are ready for redeployment, with an additional approximately 1,000 staff identified for potential redeployment assignments in the days and weeks ahead, should developments take us to that situation. I want to thank all of the City employees who are continuing to do their jobs and to provide needed services to residents of the City of Toronto, and I want to thank in particular as well all of those employees who have stepped forward and volunteered, sometimes for a second time, for redeployment. I've also confirmed that the outdoor winter recreational amenities introduced as part of our Welcome TO Winter Plan are continuing so that people have an opportunity to have safe outdoor recreational activities. And this is particularly in view of the fact that some of our indoor programs have had to be curtailed or cancelled in light of provincial directives. The programs that we're, of course, continuing with that were offered on an expanded or modified basis compared to last year include skating, a shinny on our outdoor rinks across the city, uh, and if you'll recall, last winter, an additional 64 kilometers of park pathways and trails were added to the city's uh, typical snow clearing operations, in addition to what is normally 270 kilometers of uh, paths and trails that are cleared. So that's a substantial increase, which will be continued into this year. We've worked to continue this uh, this year and expanded to pathways and trails in 40 new park locations, and we've enhanced winter maintenance in 35 additional parks. As well, uh, this has added to 26 toboggan hills in neighborhoods across Toronto, seven snow loops for walking and snowshoeing at four city golf courses, with loops ranging from one kilometer in length to two and a half kilometers in length. There are also seven disc golf locations, including an expanded 18-hole course at the Scar Scarlet Woods Golf Course and a new nine-hole nine disc golf course at Dentonia Golf Course. 
High Park Car Free Weekends will continue to allow for more walking and safe cycling within the park, and staff are working, weather permitting, to open ski hills at Earl Bales and Centennial Parks on January the 15th. I'm proud to be mayor of a city with a public service so committed and so dedicated to helping residents get through this pandemic. The stories I'm hearing, and some of which you are seeing on the news, but many of which you don't see, but I hear of them in the reports that I receive of the courage and the dedication and the bravery of our first responders and others offering city services within our broader public service are mind-boggling in terms of just how much they represent the dedication of people who themselves are fatigued. They're both fatigued and frustrated as you are with the pandemic as a whole, but also they're fatigued and frustrated because they've been working so hard uh, in the presence of elevated uh, conditions requiring their attention. The variant, the Omicron variant, has, has further complicated all of these things, uh, and it has made those uh, public servants anxious, but of course it's also made everybody in Toronto, all of the residents of the city, anxious. That said, I want to reassure Torontonians again that we are laser focused as a city administration on the continuation of essential and critical city services that people rely on across the city and on our vaccination efforts. Our attention has increased on all of those from what was already an incredibly intense uh, effort we were making successfully as a city to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible with special attention paid to those who may find it more uh, difficult to access vaccinations or may be hesitant uh, to do so. And that now includes new initiatives that we have announced today to help our school boards and to help our schools get reopened because this is a priority for us as well and we join all of the people who want to see that happen on January the 17th to do whatever we can uh, to make that possible. Toronto's emergency services will continue to respond to emergency calls without interruption. It's important to repeat this so people know that even with some of these staffing challenges, we have plans in place to make sure that these services will continue to be available to people. Critical operations will continue so that, for example, safe drinking water continues uh, to come out of the taps. It's something we often take for granted. The snow continues to get cleared. The garbage and solid waste continue to get picked up. And, of course, vaccination efforts continue. I continue to urge all Toronto residents to get their COVID-19 vaccines, whether it's first, second dose, booster third doses, or to get their children vaccinated. These vaccines are safe and they're proving based on the numbers that we are seeing to be effective in keeping people healthier and in protecting the overall health of Torontonians. These vaccines can save you from life-threatening uh, symptoms and protect the healthcare system as well. We will get through this. Uh, the city is absolutely focused and determined, starting with me as mayor, the senior leadership team that you uh, see here, as well as people like the city manager, Chris Murray, Councillor Joe Cressy, who's been so instrumental in helping us to get these educational uh, initiatives off the ground, and many, many other people in leadership positions and all the way through the entire city administration. And that is proof positive of how working together allows us to get things done. And that includes working together with the other governments, which we will continue to do. I'd like to now ask Dr. Davila to uh, offer her remarks for today. Thank you, Mayor Tory, and good morning. Over the past week, the team at Toronto Public Health has received a number of inquiries from both media and members of the public on the Omicron variant and the effectiveness of vaccine against it. On Tuesday, I spoke of the highly transmissible nature of the Omicron variant. I noted that many of us are experiencing how contagious this variant is firsthand with friends, family, colleagues and acquaintances contracting COVID-19 at an unprecedented rate. And given the degree of spread in the community, especially with nearly 90% of those 12 years of age and older with two doses of vaccine, we've received a number of questions as of late about vaccine effectiveness. We've read your social media posts and taken your phone calls asking about how could it be that after doing everything right, getting fully vaccinated with two doses, getting a booster dose, limiting in-person contacts, wearing a mask and practicing all the public health measures, how could it be that you or someone you love has COVID-19? We are seeing 
both firsthand and in the emerging science that COVID-19 and the Omicron variant in particular is very, very difficult to stop. This virus will take every opportunity it has to replicate. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada, based on Ontario data, each Omicron case infects about four and a half times more people than each Delta case. So we must continue to do everything we can to limit Omicron spread, including vaccination and all of the self-protection measures that have served us well over the course of the pandemic. We know this makes a difference and we're seeing this in recent scientific studies. As of December the 30th, in Canada, the majority of confirmed Omicron cases, or about 60%, were in unvaccinated people. And studies to date are showing good vaccine effectiveness in the range of 70 to 78% against hospitalization due to Omicron infection after receiving a third dose of vaccine. So as the mayor just said, getting a first, second and third dose of vaccine when you're eligible is essential. And I encourage you to get the vaccines you're eligible for as soon as you can. It can help to decrease your risk of infection. And should you get COVID-19, it reduces the severity of the disease. I want you to think about driving for a moment. If you drive, there are many steps that you take to reduce the likelihood that you'll find yourself in a motor vehicle accident. Things like watching your speed, driving for the weather conditions, keeping your vehicle in good working order, turning on your lights to make sure that you're visible to others. Alone, any of these measures will help. Used together, they significantly reduce the risk that you will experience a car accident. For months, I've been encouraging all of us to follow what we call measures of self-protection. These measures are like the road safety measures I've just described. With Omicron and its ability to spread from person to person, the measures I'm asking you to take include things like reducing your in-person contacts as much as possible, wearing a well-fitting, high-quality mask, the best quality you can get, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, completing your daily screening before you leave your household, and staying home when you're ill. Remember, Doing one of these things alone will help to reduce your risk. Do all of them together, and the likelihood that you will contract Omicron is significantly reduced. Getting fully vaccinated against COVID-19 is like wearing your seatbelt. You can do everything right and still be in a car accident through no fault of your own. But wearing your seatbelt could save your life. In a similar fashion, that's the power of COVID-19 vaccination, especially the third booster dose. It's like your seatbelt. It could make your illness less severe. It could save your life if you contract COVID-19. So I'm asking you to recommit to doing all that you can to keep yourself, your household, and your community safe. Toronto Public Health, we will do everything in our power to ensure that vaccine is available and as accessible as possible. And as the mayor said, together we will get through this. I'll now turn it over to Chief Pegg to deliver his remarks. Thank you, Dr. Davila, and good morning. I'm pleased to report that each of our emergency and essential services continue to operate without interruption. This includes both fire and paramedic services, Toronto Water, shelter support and housing, senior services and long-term care, 
children's services, and our city-operated COVID-19 vaccine clinics. Each of these teams continues to do an exceptional job of managing through the challenges associated with increased numbers of staff being unable to report for duty as a result of COVID-19. Yesterday, our emergency and essential services operated with an average unplanned absence rate of 13.7%. Between December 23rd and January 5th, those same emergency and essential services operated with an average unplanned absence rate of 11.5%. Our team continues to implement their respective mitigation plans effectively, thereby ensuring that these essential services continue to be delivered across the city. From a citywide perspective, yesterday, we operated with an average unplanned absence rate of 11.1% across all the city divisions, with the exception of agencies that include Toronto Police and TTC. Our COVID-19 Strategic Command Team continues to convene every day in order to ensure that all aspects of our citywide response to the pandemic remain responsive and effective. As both Mayor Tory and Dr. Davila outlined, our vaccine clinic operations remain strong and we continue to administer vaccines each day at the maximum possible rate. While unplanned absences do impact our vaccine clinic operations, our clinic operations team continue to manage and respond effectively and have robust contingency plans in place. There is no doubt that the challenges associated with the Omicron wave of the COVID-19 pandemic are both challenging and exhausting but Toronto continues to meet those challenges as they come. I would like to th acknowledge and thank everyone who continues to not only report for duty each day, but everyone who continues to extend their shifts, work overtime, and take on additional and cross-trained work in order to ensure that our essential services continue each day. I would also like to acknowledge the union and association leaders who continue to work in collaboration with the city to create and implement innovative and responsive solutions to staffing challenges that result from COVID-19. Our Emergency Operations Centre continues to be fully activated and to work non-stop in support of citywide divisional operations. Our COVID-19 incident management system continues to operate effectively and continues to be responsive to changes that arise from day to day. Our Business Continuity Task Force continues to work alongside our people in equity and senior leadership teams to ensure that critical redeployments of staff happen in response to needs as they arise. Our Personal Protective Equipment Task Force closely manages the critical PPE that our frontline staff require each day. The robust and comprehensive supply chain, inventory management, order processing and reserves management processes are ensuring that our COVID-19 strategic command team has live time visibility into inventory and pending order levels for each personal protective equipment item. Our PPE inventories are in good shape with consumption rates being monitored and updated each day, driving any proactive supply chain and ordering changes that are required. We are continuing to ensure that we have effective and workable plans in place to ensure that the services our residents need the most continue to be delivered. In closing, I encourage you to continue to make toronto.ca slash COVID-19 your first choice for up-to-date, accurate and timely information on all aspects of COVID-19 response in Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll now go to questions. First, uh, Adrian Gobril from City News Toronto. Adrian, go ahead, please. Hi. Good morning. Question for Dr. Deville. Well, sick kids and multiple other hospitals have sent out a joint statement about their concern of rising cases of young children uh, with COVID. There are a number of infants in Hamilton and Ottawa currently in hospital due to COVID. Toronto Public Health has confirmed that a child under the age of four has passed away from COVID. Wondering what your message is for families uh, who, are, who are hearing this, seeing this, and are concerned. As we know, children under the age of five still are unable to receive a vaccine. Daycares are open, child care centers are open. Um, what would your, what are your thoughts on this? And would you echo the concerns of, of the hospital networks, which have put out the joint statement? 
Well, you know, Adrian, I think when we see children ending up getting seriously ill and, uh, you know, requiring hospitalization, uh, of course we're concerned. This is not what we would like to see. We want to see our children healthy and thriving. Uh, but I think it really brings to mind and brings to focus why we all need to do the very best we can. You're right that those under the age of five are not eligible for vaccine at this point in time. But the best protection that we can offer to those who are most vulnerable in our population, including those who are not yet eligible for vaccine, is for those of us who are eligible to get vaccinated, to get vaccinated as soon as possible, and to continue practicing the measures for self-protection so that we do our very best to reduce transmission of COVID-19 at this time. This is a protection not only for ourselves, but as we've said throughout the course of the pandemic, uh, is a protection for everybody else around us, particularly those who are most vulnerable and those who cannot take vaccine at this point in time. Dr. Devella, just to follow up, from, from the data that you've seen, um, would you, is it clear to you whether or not this is simply just maybe almost like a numbers game because there's just so many people in our community now contracting the virus that eventually, similar to breakthrough cases, we're going to ha end up with some kids in hospital or tragically some children even dying? Or is there something that you're seeing in the data and in the experts? that you're speaking with that may lead you to believe that the Omicron variant may be impacting children differently? Well, you know, Adrian, I think we are still very much uh, acquiring information and increasing our understanding uh, about this relatively new variant, which has only been with us here in this area uh, of the world for about a month now. So, of course, we're constantly monitoring data and relying on the scientists who work with us to help us uh, uh, increase our understanding of this particular variant. I think to date though, in speaking to my pediatric colleagues and those who are working more directly uh, providing clinical care to children, so far, overall, the good news is that generally COVID-19 infection does not produce severe outcomes, uh, doesn't tend to lead to serious illness, but of course, it does happen from time to time where we get cases where uh, children end up getting seriously ill and may require hospitalization or have even more significant and severe outcomes and impacts. Uh, but again, to my mind, that is just yet another reminder to all of us to do everything we can in our power. That's certainly what we're doing at Toronto Public Health to facilitate the ability for people to actually take up the protective benefit of vaccine and to make sure that we are all practicing as best as possible those measures for self-protection so that we reduce the transmission of COVID-19 to the extent that we can with less COVID-19 transmission, less infection, and therefore less serious outcomes associated with those infections. All right, thank you. We'll go next to uh, Dale Manukduk from CBC News. Good morning, Dale, go ahead. Morning, thanks for taking uh, our questions. Uh, this is for Dr. Davila. We've been hearing a, a lot of people, especially in the 50 plus range, who are turning down Moderna shots in favor of Pfizer for their boosters. It seems public messaging hasn't changed since the concerns first emerged uh, in the spring. What is public health doing now to convince people that Moderna is safe and effective? Well, what we're trying to do is put the information out there to let people know that, in fact, we're seeing good vaccine effectiveness, as I've addressed in my remarks today. And, in fact, uh, our experience in our clinics, our uh, Toronto Public Health city-run clinics, we are seeing that people are taking up. And, in fact, I understand our vaccination partners at their clinics are also seeing the same thing. We are doing everything we can to make sure that people are aware of the benefit of vaccine. And in fact, there are st some studies that are showing a particular benefit uh, for, for those who receive Moderna vaccine uh, and its effectiveness against the Omicron variant. So we're certainly making sure that people as they present to our clinics are aware of this uh, and we're actually seeing them make those decisions. They're uh, voting with their feet as it were and we're seeing an increasing number of people uh, understanding and appreciating the benefit of vaccine and in particular of that Moderna vaccine uh, against Omicron. Thank you. And and another question, if, uh, if we knew that um, keeping schools open was so important to both students and parents, families in general, why did the city 
wait to prioritize education workers at the scale it's now doing? You know, I think we have done a great deal of, um, you know, uh, we've e uh, deployed a great deal of effort towards increasing vaccination. Uh, and this is for all those who are eligible, including education workers, right? When I look back at what we have done over the course of, you know, just a few short weeks, we increased our capacity for vaccine administration from 400,000 a month to 1.2 million a month. Uh, and we are continuing to find more and more venues and really exercising every opportunity that exists to get vaccines out there. The most recent with our school boards, absolutely, to try and get some very specific efforts directed towards education workers. But I think we have done everything in our power to make sure that vaccines are as accessible as possible. And we're not stopping there. There's much more that we're going to continue to do and work with our partners to see that, uh, you know, what opportunities yet exist for us to continue to increase our ability to get vaccines in arms so that people can get that protective benefit. All right, thank you. We'll uh, go next. Final question is to uh, Francine Copen from the Toronto Star. Francine, go ahead, please. Hi, <clears throat> good morning. Um, my question is for Dr. Eileen Davila. Um, now, you mentioned that the medical community is still collecting information on the impact of the Omicron variant. But from what you know, based on you know, what you've been able to collect so far, is it, is it acting differently when it comes to children? Are, are more children getting infected? Is the disease more serious now in children with this Omicron variant? I think there's a lot of concern around that. And anything that you can say to sort of, you know, enlighten parents, I think would be uh, really helpful. So uh, Francine, uh, I think that we have heard from our clinical partners that we are seeing a little bit of an increase. I think there is much more that needs to be done to better characterize what exactly they're seeing and what might be underlying that. Uh, but that being said, I, I have to keep coming back to the core message, which is that the best thing that we can do, particularly to protect young people who are not themselves eligible at this point in time for vaccine, is for the rest of us to get vaccine. There are many of us who are eligible and who have yet to take up the opportunity to take vaccine. Uh, we are working really hard here at the city, along with all our vaccination partners, to make opportunities as available as we can to these individuals. So I would just encourage people, please, uh, find the way to get vaccinated. And if you're already vaccinated, help somebody who you know is not yet vaccinated to get vaccinated. Continue to practice the measures for self-protection. Uh, this is what we can do to best protect those who cannot yet get vaccinated at this point in time and those who are most vulnerable to serious outcomes associated with COVID-19. Um, my follow-up question, um, I, I think you, you addressed this a little bit at the beginning um, of the question period, but um, are we in fact looking at a numbers game? Is it because we're seeing so many people infected that we're seeing more kids being hospitalized or is there any indication that it could be something else, that it could be something to do with this particular new variant? So Francine, I think that's what uh, has yet to be completely sorted out. Clearly, the more transmission we see in the community, the more infections there are, and the greater the likelihood that some of those infections, just be by sheer volume, as you're uh, implying, will have more serious outcomes. But I think there is still much to, for us to really understand in respect of the Omicron variant, as I mentioned earlier, it's only actually been with us in this community for a few weeks. And in fact, it was only identified uh, in the world uh, in, in mid-November, if I've got my timing correct. So we're only talking about a variant with which uh, we've lived for a few weeks now, much, much learning that yet has to be done. And certainly uh, we're going to keep up with that and make sure that our new knowledge, the knowledge that we acquire is infused into the work that we do, whether it's within the realm of public health or within the clinical and healthcare setting. All right, thank you very much. That uh, concludes all the questions we have for today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please stay well.